do it, Pakash. Everything is yours. Thanks, Peter. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. I am Prakash Sangam, one of the board members at WCA. I would like to offer a warm welcome to you all for uh, our, you know to our 6G conference. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, as we all know, 5G has dominated the technology discussions in the last uh, two to three years. But with uh, initial 5G deployments done, at least in most of the leading markets, um, the discussion is moving towards 5G advanced and 6G. However, I know 5G monetization is still a challenge for operators. You know, there are a few new revenue streams that they have found in terms of fixed wireless access and you know with unlimited offerings and so on but they're still looking at uh, you know ways of monetizing all the investments that they have done and the grand promise of 5g such as massive iot urllc industry 4.0 are yet to be fulfilled so then you know among all of this the discussion about 6g is starting so the natural question everybody has is you know, is it too early to talk about 6G? What can 6G do that 5G or 5G Advanced can do? What are the new concepts, new technologies that are being introduced or that, that will be needed for 6G? When should the industry should start working on them? And what are the spectrum considerations and on and on and on, right? So like, you know, with any new uh, G that comes in, you have the similar questions uh probably a little bit more uh in 6g because the discussions are starting now so we have a very well-rounded uh panel representing uh, different parts of the ecosystem to answer these questions uh let let me get started with some introductions um i'm i'm prakash sangam as i mentioned i'm the founder and uh, principal at tantra analyst we are a boutique industry analyst firm covering 5g 6g now uh, Wi-Fi, AI, IoT, and other tech areas. Uh, uh, before uh, before that, I spent more than 20 years working for AT&T, Ericsson, and Qualcomm. I write for Forbes, Fierce Wireless, RC Wireless News, and others. I also host a podcast called Tantra's Mantra, and, and I'm also a member of uh, 3GPP, so I know a thing or two about standardization. Enough about me. Let's introduce our esteemed panel. Uh, let's start, I uh, know, uh, I would like each of our panelists to um, quickly introduce themselves, uh, their background, their company, and answer this question. Uh, what is 60 in your view, and your could be your personal, your company's view, or from your domain's perspective? Um, and then you know we get on to, to the discussion. So again, uh, what is you know introduce yourself, your company. Uh, and answer the question, what is 60 in your view? Uh, let's start with uh, Dan. Dan? Thanks, Prakash. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Warren. I'm uh, the Director of Advanced Network Research at Samsung, uh, Samsung Research UK. Um, and uh, we've just launched a, a 6G research team. So I've just gone run through a hiring round of bringing in a, a whole bunch of people to help me answer the question that Prakash has just asked uh, about what is 6G and, and, uh, and what's it going to do. Um, I, I think right now, uh, in the early stages of, of beginning to, to really think about what 6G delivers, certainly uh, above and beyond uh, 5G advances, there's a few places where we're going to work on disruption. And, and they're perhaps not the traditional places. So. Um, we within our team are, are not focusing so much on uh, a new radio interface or um, high frequency spectrum bands. We're looking more at end-to-end -end system architecture. Um, and with the exception of softwareization, that hasn't been disrupted for quite some time. So the, the softwareization um, of the end-to-end -end architecture has been an ongoing trend as, as uh, the performance metrics of a software-based implementation come up to the, the levels which are required for a, a fully softwareized core and, and radio. Now that we've got there, the next question for us to answer, I think, is um, is the network that we've designed, particularly in 5G with uh, SBA and, uh, uh, and a fragmented RAN, uh, is that as optimized as it can be? And then the second question is, is it as optimizable as it can be? Um, and so the, the second uh, stream of research that we're conducting is around 
how to implement AI within that architecture in a way which is pragmatic, uh, which allows uh, AI applications to interact with each other uh, and sort out any conflicts, and then to be able to essentially deliver more with less resource and start to focus more on some of the key value indicators that are coming through in the 6G um, requirement setting stage. So I think that there probably will be work on new air interfaces and we can talk around uh, spectrum bands, spectrum requirements, uh, KPIs and the like as well. But uh, I'm laying out a stall early that uh, what we're gonna be focusing on in, in SRUK at least uh, is a, a slightly different approach to end-to-end -end system architecture as well. And thank you, Lord. We'll discuss all of that uh, during your panel. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Next is Ben. Yeah, thanks, Prakash. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Ben Coffin. I am the 6G Solutions Marketing Lead at Keysight. Um, so we have spun up a 6G program office, and I am essentially the liaison from the program office into our global marketing organization. Um, uh, we are, you know, it's it's my job to when when you Google or when you come to a test vendor and you say, so what's going on in 6G? my job is to make sure that we have our story straight and that we're articulating that appropriately. I'm taking synthesizing what all the smart people in our program office are figuring out and testing and prototyping right now and being able to articulate that. So um, uh, just quick background for me, I've, I've got about 10 years in test and measurement industry, mostly focused in the research space, primarily in academia with collaborations between industry and academia and government and academia. Um, a lot of the test bed community I've spent my time in, um, but now focusing in in really hard in the 6G domain, um, uh, you know, from from our view as Keysight as a test vendor, you know, we see 6G as a unification of a lot of moving pieces inside of um, uh, uh, the, the ecosystem. It's it's a connection of not only um, uh, the the physical and digital worlds, but also the human world, and bringing in you know aspects of some of the societal impacts that networking has. So whether that's a sustainability vertical or just the connectivity vertical, and and what access means to people. Um, you know, uh, for us, I think it, it breaks down and, and, you know, I think traditionally what you would expect is, hey, we're talking about, you know, new spectrum that would be available in 6G prototyping and something like the sub terahertz bands that that is absolutely something we have on our radar, but we, we see 6G is a lot more than that from from a test vendor perspective, we see it as uh, figuring out how to uh, integrate AI and how to be able to use optimizations throughout the network and, and that being sort of native functionality um, in the 6G network, as well as also having, you know, uh, uh, looking at how do we uh, uh, take on new network architecture ideas and being able to to combine things that we've kicked off in in maybe 5G, 5G advanced, being able to look at 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 what pieces from uh, the previous standards or or initiatives like ORAN are are putting together, um, and then also I think the the other thing that I'll throw in here into the mix is that we see technologies like digital twins becoming a a really necessary part of the workflow when we're talking about 6G and having to have a digital parity. Uh, uh, that you have working alongside of of where 6G is going to go as we go into that development process. Um, that's something that we're keeping uh, a front of mind. Um, so yeah, I think that's for the most part uh, uh, where we sort of see our our uh, the world of 6G evolving and where and where we're we're plugged in there. Right, thank you, Michael. <clears throat> you want me? It's my turn. Yes, sir. Great. Okay. Um, as opposed to some of the other speakers, I'm primarily interested in the spectrum aspects of 6G and particularly the above 100 gigahertz spectrum aspects, which are fascinating because 6G, no doubt, will use much lower spectrum, just like 4G uses, is using previous spectrum. Uh, but 6G probably will have access to spectrum above 100 gigahertz, which it needs to get the lightning fast speeds that are going to be needed. Now, realistically, it will probably need spectrum above 100 gigahertz first for backhaul before it uses it for uplinks and downlinks because the, the need for uplinks and downlinks faster than 5G is still somewhat speculative. But if there are lots and lots of, of uh, uplinks and downlinks, backhaul goes up very fast, whether the uplinks are, are super fast by themselves. And today, and in the future, most backhaul will be done by fiber optics, not needing spectrum, most. But I believe you cannot build a network entirely with fiber optics. 
because there are always special events, there are always emergencies, uh, there are always special locations where fiber is amazingly expensive in a few in a few locations, and you need a little bit of radio for backhaul in both 5G and 6G. But in 5G, it's not a problem because the backhaul rates in 5G can be met with existing uh, spectrum allocations. The, there are fixed spectrum allocations as high as 12 and a half gigahertz bandwidth uh, if, you, if you stay below 150 gigahertz. Um, but the, the bandwidths you're gonna need for a very dense 5G network or for a 6G network if fast uplinks and downlinks come in will, will probably exceed what's achievable with, with the 12 and a half gigahertz uh, bit maximum bandwidth now and you'll need greater bandwidth of 20, 30, 40 gigahertz. And the, the, those of us who look at spectrum at above 100 gigahertz quickly realize that as opposed to spectrum below 100 gigahertz, passive uses are much, much more common. Uh, I worked at FCC 25 years, passive uses of spectrum were just sort of something amusing. As I like to joke, did anyone ever miss TV channel 37? There is no TV channel 37, the spectrum 608 to 614, that should be channel 30 to 37. All TV sets would, would have tuned to that, but in reality, there was nothing over the air. If you connected an old TV set to a cable system, you indeed would see something at 608 to 614, but over the year, you, you wouldn't see anything, but, the, but that was invisible to the public and was just sort of intellectually amusing. But above 100 gigahertz, 17% of the spectrum in 100 to 275, 17% of the spectrum uh, is allocated to passive. But more important, there are about a dozen bands between 100 and 275 gigahertz that are there. And the presence of those bands chops up the spectrum. And that's what results in the fact that in today's status quo, the maximum bandwidth you can get is 12 and a half gigahertz. Fortunately, when most of the allocations above 100 gigahertz were made, at the 2000 World Radio Conference. They were proposed by the US and the US and its European counterpart, CEPT, realized A, nobody really knew what the fixed and mobile uses were above 100 gigahertz, but B, nobody knew whether sharing was or wasn't possible. It's pretty clear that sharing of the same bands below 50 gigahertz is impossible because of propagation issues. But as you get above 100 gigahertz, propagation becomes very different. Look at my article on IEEE microwave in the January issue, and you'll have more than you ever want to know about that. But basically, most telecom use of spectrum is horizontal or near horizontal. And if frequency is above 100 gigahertz, atmospheric attenuation is important. And any path that reaches a satellite has, her, has huge attenuation before it gets there. And this is one of the reasons why sharing may be possible. So a key issue of 6G planning is, can we figure out a way to share 6G spectrum with passive uses on a non-interference basis? Fortunately, at WRC 2000, the US proposed a framework for that, which is now known as uh, WRC uh, Resolution 731, which has safeguards to protect the, pot, the passive users, but makes clear that, that sharing was the intent of the ITU. Unfortunately, certain federal agencies, whose names won't be mentioned here, uh, apparently oppose that U.S. position in the year 2000 and still oppose it and like to pretend it never existed. So there is a problem, both a technical problem and policy problems to be resolved if we're ever going to get the large bandwidth above 100 gigahertz. And I'd be glad to answer questions about that if somebody wants to, but I'll stop right now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Alex. Thanks. Uh, I'm Alex Lawrence. I'm the managing editor of 6G World. Uh, so I am a journalist. Uh, I, I come to this with a, a very different perspective, I think, than, than some of the other colleagues on this call. Um, for me, my understanding of, of 6G is, is basically the same as Forrest Gump. You know, 6G is as 6G does. Um, We've had requirements come in from uh, nations around the world that 6G should be able to you know, deliver coverage everywhere, uh, close digital divides, uh, it should be more sustainable, it should be more secure and trustworthy. Um, 
not surprisingly. I mean, if, if we're going to have 6G coverage everywhere powering all of our IoT, it'd be nice if Vladimir Putin can't be driving our cars for us. Um, so these elements have come in and then uh, just in the last few days, the NGMN put out um, some requirements from the operator side, which is to make sure that you know it's incredibly low power again, um, elements of sustainability are in there, reuse of as much as possible from, from 5G and 5G advanced so that they don't have to fork out enormous amounts to, to reinvent the wheel. Um, so, you know, all of that then sort of leads on into a lot of these sort of technical questions about how we do this, how we make sure that um, we can deliver all these things uh, and all the, the expected um, services and and still do that in a way that that doesn't bankrupt everybody um so there's huge amounts of, of technical details involved in in doing that and actually accomplishing it but um you know to me that's that's the the sort of answer as to what 6g is it's going to be a whole host of, of technical answers to these these multiple very challenging problems and thank you alex uh... We have one more panelist uh, who had to run for a customer emergency. You know, customers that came, we come always first. So uh, that's Ian uh, from uh, VIV Solutions. He'll be joining us soon. So we'll bring him in when, when he joins. So, hey, Prakash, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay. Thanks, Excellent. Ian. Yeah. Perfect timing. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> yes. So would you just give uh, your background uh, What and then you know what 60 in your view or your company is or domains view? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Prakash and uh, WCA for, for the invitation to be part of this webinar panel. Um, yeah, my name is Ian Huang. I, I work for Viavi Solutions, um, a test and measurement company, uh, everything about the network. Um, so I'm kind of the director of wireless uh, in the CTO office there. Um, and I'm actually currently in the ORAN Alliance uh, meeting <laughs> in, in Prague, and that's why I was a bit late. Um, had to uh, you know attend to some business there. Um, for me uh, and for our company, really 6G, what it's about, it's really about, um, let's call it the, the, the cynical side of me is it'll fulfill the promises 5G made <laughs> in some cases. Um, things like truly uh, ubiquitous um, connectivity, um, you know, truly knowing how to utilize millimeter wave bands uh, and above. Uh, but but I think you know what's what I would like 6G to truly be is um, going back to our um, you know thinking about uh, you know being really uh, good stewards of our natural resources in terms of sustainability um, you know being truly energy efficient um, enough that we can you know provide really good ubiquitous services on top of that um, I think you know it, it behooves us as an industry. To think about, um, you know, not the next great shiny object, uh, but really to think about, you know, how, you know, are the, provide the services that are truly critical at a uh, really as low cost in terms of energy and, uh, you know, in, you know, dollars uh, as we can. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. So thanks for all the introductions. I think it's a good time to, uh, if I can. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm trying to. Okay. Never mind. So okay. Yeah. Thank you for all of the introduction. Um, uh, I we will take audience questions. I already see some of them uh, already. So and as we go through the discussion, you know, please keep thinking about the questions. Uh, put them in the Q and A box on the uh, you know Zoom. Uh, uh, portal so we'll look at them and I pick them up as we go through the discussion so keep them coming right so uh, let's get on to the questions uh, the first one let's start with Ian uh, because he came late <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, do you think 60 will be a revolution or a evolution will it build on 5g advance and 5g or it will be a clear demarcation point as you know this is not 60 and that is 60. 
Uh, that's that's a great question. Again, I'll, I'll try to do my my best Bill Clinton impression. But what do you mean by revolution versus evolution? You know, uh, but uh, you know, I mean, kidding aside, I, I mean, like to me, you know, revolution really means something, you know, fundamental paradigm shift on on how we do things and and how things are done. Um, and so, given that, the, again, going back to the um, pragmatic side of me, I really think it's going to be an evolution for the most part, right? You know, we as an industry have matured through five generations doing, I would say, you know, a really good job of providing, you know, connectivity to, you know, the large masses in the world, right? So, um, I think we will have new spectrum. Uh, I think we will do a much better job of, of utilizing that spectrum, providing the services that are critical uh, for, for our societies. But, um, you know, on the other hand, I think there will be potential for revolution in certain areas. Um, things like, uh, you know, machine learning, uh, using that technology as a way to truly automate the network, uh, to truly, you know, again, going back to being re really good stewards of our resources, uh, you know, lowering the cost, um, you know, utilizing automation to do that. You can call that a revolution or really more of an evolution to where we are, but but at least for for me, that is um, is is what is the most critical um, to, uh, to happen. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Alex. Um, yeah, that's uh, it, it. Is a fun question. Um, if you look at it from the the technology perspective, then uh, I think there are definite um, aspects of evolution and revolution. Um, you know, certainly this seems to be the, the, the way that discussions are, are headed. Uh, the ITU will be producing recommendations later this year, but uh, as I understand it so far, um, there will be elements that are genuinely new and other pieces that, that build on uh, what's there for 5G and 5G advanced. Um, I think there is scope um, for there to be a, a quiet revolution going on um, in terms of the, the business models and the relationships between the the telcos as we understand them and and both sort of customers enterprises and, and governments out there um, over the course of the next decade as, as we head into 6g i think the question there will be you know to what extent the the risk appetite um and the the openness to to try different business models um will will be able to to sort of translate in, into the real world um but I mean, certainly we're, we're already starting to see revolutions, if you like, as, as we move towards more of a, a network of networks, as, as we move to, to more uh, open and disaggregated structures um, and, and the, the opportunities for different business models there. So um, I think, you know, on, on the technology side, hopefully there, there will be pieces of both evolution and revolution sooner or later whether we like it or not, then, then there's a revolution coming in the other stuff. Michael, any news there? Obviously, terahertz will be kind of revolutionary, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think the, the high bandwidth that you're going to get through using upper spectrum allows a revolution. The question is, are people re really going to come up with, with applications to take advantage of that? We see even now that 5G gives much greater bandwidth than 4G but his, it, it takes a while for, for, for uses of spectrum to, to develop that can use the maximum speeds that are available. And, and, and the key issue in 6G is, is, are there real uses where end users need that type of high speed? Thank you. Thank you. Ben? Yeah, I mean, I think similar to to what some of the other panelists are saying, I think the the answer right now is at least it's from our perspective both an evolution and a revolution. You know, the, we we anticipate that um, you know on the evolution front, there's going to be improvements to the air interface. There's going to be enhanced network flexibility. We're going to see capacity increase. I think that you know th those all things are with every G we we anticipate some of that. I think where we see revolution, and again, this is this is sort of um, uh, jumping 
off what what like Ian was mentioning about machine learning is that you know we're we're looking at ultimately 6G being a much more software centric design from the get go and a software centric network and being able to have these virtual and open platforms out the gate that was where I think the revolution part of it has the most potential where to, we really can look at how we from from the design of the network to the actual execution of the network everything being either um you know ai optimized or or just just in terms of its uh, uh, like a purely uh, uh software based infrastructure where you can have an open developer community and the idea of of enabling that sort of thing you i mean if we look at where where we've seen open developer communities accelerate technology in the past you know on, in 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 other spaces that sort of opportunity to actually completely uh, open up new spaces we hadn't even thought about you know i think that that's where we could see revolution come in um uh, so I, again I, I think similarly we right now it's it's going to be a little bit of both there there's going to be things that we um you know how many people anticipated chat gpt doing what it's done in the past few months right there's going to be some of that explosion that happens as we integrate those technologies but also there's going to be the the sort of steady evolutions of improving things and and uh incremental optimizations thank you dan yeah i guess i guess i'm kind of on the same page as everyone else and and at the to, to try and put a slightly different perspective on it, it it's it's only a revolution if if everybody within the community feels it right and so the, the the revolution depends upon which community you're looking at so you know we on this call and looking at some of the questions and the names that are in the participant list as well we are generally in that weird space of telco future facing geekdom um, and so something for something to be revolutionary for us, it has to be a paradigm shift at the technology level. Um, and when, when those kind of things take place within the telecoms industry, often they go almost ignored at the, at the customer level. You know, they, they don't really change a great deal in terms of what that gets delivered to an end user. Um, they just do something in the network, which means it runs better or it delivers more or that the level of coverage is increased. And everybody kind of looks at their phone or looks at their device and just goes, huh, that's new, but moves on. You know, so if you were to ask consumers what was revolutionary, the last big revolution was a smartphone. And there hasn't really been anything much since then. It's just smartphones that got bigger and faster. Um, so for a revolution to take place on a, on a customer basis, you know, particularly in developed markets, we, we're at a total saturation in terms of, or pretty close to saturation in terms of uh, consumer delivery. So for a business case, um, a business case revolution to take place, it needs to be something outside of traditional consumer delivery, which takes us back to how you open up the door for business to business. And there, there is all kinds of potential for revolution, because at the moment, really, we're not delivering much more than just um, a, a, a slightly different version of a consumer service um, to a lot of users. That revolution has to come on both sides, it has to come on the side of other industries coming in and, and participating, but it also has to go be a revolution in the way that um, the services get sold back into, into that B2B opportunity. And then, um, you know, to, to kind of round that point out, I don't necessarily think that's a 6G revolution. I think that's just a coincidence in timing that it's coming around about now. There's a groundswell at the moment, which says for mobile operators to be sustainable because of that high level of saturation on the consumer side, it's either a rapid race to the bottom on pricing, or you've got to find new market opportunity. And to find new market opportunity, that means you need to find the next really big potential number of uh, connections that you can go after. And that's the thing which we've been trying to address from 4G through 5G and, and now onwards into 6G, because we haven't got the answer right yet. Yeah, yeah. so and, you know, even if you look at 5G, there's so much of promise of IoT and business to business that that is yet to be realized, right? So mm -hmm. probably it is 5G and once, probably it is 60 when we'll see it. So as you said, it's a matter of time or the technology or both together. That's, that's a great, uh, great viewpoint. So let's start with you, Dan, again. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we all of you touched upon this a little bit. So, so far, when you looked at a new G, most of the time, the definition of uh, that next G would be <clears throat> just the you know, faster speeds, lower latency, all based on the performance of the system as such, right? 
But uh, it seems, at least when you look at the wish list right now and what people are talking about, this next generation, the shift is more towards not just these technical performance parameters in terms of definition, but also on more societal impacts like sustainability, you know, uh, climate change, how we can reduce the power consumption, for example. It started with 5G advance to some extent. And also on a digital divide, I mean, there is, we are talking about gigabit speeds, multiple gigabit speeds in some areas, whereas the other areas, they're not yet to see, you know, good, uh, reliable broadband and so on, right? Uh, and uh, there's a big uh, divide between the have and the have nots in terms of uh, connectivity, because connectivity has become kind of a basic need, just like electricity, water, and other utilities and so on. So do you think uh, the discussion of 6G will be, you know, obviously it has to be balanced, but it'll be more, uh, more uh, starting from the viewpoint of uh, this equitable development and so on, not just improving, uh, you know, incremental improvements in speed and latency and so on. Dan, mm. now I I think I think that we, you know, th there's a number of things that are taking place in in broader society right now which tell us that it can't be just about uh, a tenfold increase in speed and a tenfold reduction in latency and and you make a chipset and stick it in a phone and everybody buys it because it's new and shiny. It has to be delivering something else, which has to be more about addressing uh, societal images, uh, sorry, societal challenges. Um, you know, and, and, and we can see that coming from a number of different point of views, right? So uh, somebody already has referenced the NGMN white paper that came out a couple of days ago. If you flick through that, it's not until you get to about page 20 of 24 that there's any mention of, of increasing bandwidth or, or any real practical implementation of increasing bandwidth. Before that, it's a lot more about sustainability, coverage, energy efficiency. All of those things are coming across from um, an operator mouthpiece. Those are the, the most fundamental requirements. And obviously those things are, are also good business metrics, you know, apart from being um, a really nice uh, societal uh, marketing exercise. If you deliver higher levels of coverage, you, you address more customers. If you reduce energy efficiency or increase energy efficiency, reduce energy consumption, you reduce OPEX. So th there are good reasons, good business reasons for going after some of these challenges as well. Um, and then when you go kind of back into to the, the seeds of what's been going on around this for some time, both myself and Alex are, are ex-GSMA alma mater. Um, we have seen the, the GSMA push around societal development goals um, and all the work that they've been doing around that, both at World Congress and, and elsewhere for some time. That's reflected into lots of the um, regional research agendas that you start seeing coming out um, around research funding that's taking place right now, whether it's 5G advanced or 6G. Um, so, you know, we, we've, we know there's a research challenge there. We have clear evidence that operators want to go after these goals. Um, so, so certainly from the perspective of where I'm trying to line up the research that, that we're doing in my little corner of Samsung, those are the kind of aspects that we want to go after in the first instance. Um, and then, you know, we, we, I won't say we're ignoring the air interface, but it's certainly not our primary priority right now. It's, uh, it's more around that... Um, end-to-end -end sustainability and, and, and building an architecture which enables full optimization at the at the highest level. Great, thank you. Ben? Yeah, I you know, I, I think um uh I, I definitely agree with what Dan was saying in terms of like it, it's the human aspect of 6G. I think in terms of what our role that we play as the telecoms industry, like that it can't go unignored, um, I think is, is, is really the, the biggest part there. There's, um, you know, I think one, one other way for us to think about it, um, especially, you know, I think sustainability, we've, we've obviously seen uh, a, a lot of push on the sustainability front, um, uh, in terms of energy efficiency, energy optimization, right? There's a clear business case there. Um, uh, you know, if you look at the power spend of, of some of these operators, like they, they, are, they would love to cut those numbers down and it, and it saves them a lot of, of, uh, uh money and time to be able to do that. Um, but the, the other places that I think we can look and broaden that sustainability point of view a bit further is also both our own supply chain, um, and, and looking at, 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 you know, if we, if we think about, 
um, uh, sustainable manufacturing practices and and being able to 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 have something like a energy star type rating on on radio units or 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 on on you know network infrastructure equipment. Um, uh, and being able to say, hey, you know what, we actually have traceability, and we're going to push for traceability, like that is something that we are going to say, hey, you know, operators will uh, um, uh, prioritize these energy efficient uh, uh, devices, because it's not only that they, they work uh, efficiently, but they were developed in, with, you know, ef uh, efficient uh, production practices. I think that's one space where where we can, you know, really see that this um, uh, we can drive change there. Um, and the, and the other side too, is also, you know, we're, we're responsible for connectivity, right? I think thinking about how we can partner with other industries, um, I'll give smart agriculture as I think one that I'm, I'm personally pretty excited about in terms of, you know, agriculture has been working for, for a while to figure out, you know, how do we, how do they best optimize for organic practices and, and, for for practices that that are sustainable on on their front and being able to to go after those goals i think from a a unified front and there's some interesting research that's happening at the university levels around these sorts of things where where it's really how can how can we provide connectivity into uh, uh the agriculture space that that helps them achieve their goals like i think that's part of where um uh i think i think there's opportunity there um and, you know, I, I think uh, overall, uh, you know, the economics of, of like slightly separate from, from the sustainability angle of it is, is figuring out just how do we make this all work from, from an economic angle of, you know, if we look at the consumer use cases of where things want to go for XR or for metaverse, and you kind of have these immersive dual K dual 8K monitor, you know, you know, environments and, and those data rates. Like, how does that, how does the business model for that unlimited data uh, uh, persist, right? And then how does that sort of coexist with the, the, you know, rural requirements, which are much, much, you know, we're not, we're not talking about those or uh, uh, the, those VR environments necessarily yet, but, you know, maybe eventually it gets there. And what sort of things like non-terrestrial networking can, can be brought in there to, to help solve those problems, you know, whether it's Leo or it's HAPS, um, uh, I think those are, are, are uh, things we need to, to sort out on the economic side of what's the right mix of technologies uh, to get there. Thank you. A quick note, I'm seeing all of the questions that you guys are posting, which are really good. I will not be able to take each one of them, but I'm making sure that I'm combining them and making one larger question for all the panelists. So please keep them coming. Uh, thank you, Ben. So, hey, Michael, any views there? Michael? No, I don't, no, I don't, no, no views on that issue. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Ian? Yeah, I'll be okay to move on. Yeah, that, those were really good. Thank you. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very easy to talk about this stuff all, all day. I mean, there are so many complex uh, levels to, to deal with here. Um, but, but I mean, I, I think if we're talking about sort of what we need to provide and, and so on, I'd agree with Dan. Uh, things like the air interface are, are maybe um, byproducts of some of the, the the sort of big big ticket items these these sort of pieces about sustainability you know if we have if we have a revolution in the consumer domain i mean frankly from my perspective actually being able to reliably make a video call on a train would be amazing and this is in the middle of britain um you know that would be a revolution if we can make that happen as well in the middle of um you know well pretty much anywhere that you want to be uh, you know, remote Tanzania or whatever, then that, that will be a revolution there. And, um, and and I think we just need to be uh, aware of kind of the impacts that we can make, and then use a whole smorgasbord of technologies to to get to that. Perfect. So, um, I mean, we talked about this. Uh, whether you know whether really 6G needs a new radio interface. If so, why? Ben, you want to start uh, with that? I mean, uh, yeah, I think I think the uh, I'll keep mine fairly brief because I, I I'd, I'd also like to hear from some other folks. But I mean, I I think where we're headed for six G's air interfaces, it's you know right now we're talking about 
Um, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've had a human design air interface and now we're getting to a human designed and AI optimized interface. And I think we're going to move towards having a fully AI designed interface. Um, you know, I think the trick is that it's going to have to be backwards compatible, um, uh, and being able to figure out exactly, you know, like, I think one of my favorite conversations that happened around 5g was do we abandon OFDM or not? Right. And, and, and is there, are there new waveforms that we should go after? Um, I think the question is, is, is whatever we're deciding that we want to leave behind, do we, ha does it make sense to do that? And do the economics make sense? And, and, uh, is it at the end of the day going to provide, um, uh, the, uh, the improvements to the network that are going to match up with, I think the use cases that are going to drive the need. Thank you, Michael. Any views there, especially looking at the wider bandwidth that terahertz kind of spectrum will provide. Um, I can say something there. Um, sorry, okay. Michael. Um, do you would did you want to jump in? Um, so, I mean, my my thoughts on this are that um, there is always call for more spectrum, and it's going to be useful. There's no no question about that. Um, for some services like doing combined uh, sensing and um, communications, then it, it makes sense to be using uh, new uh, spectrum elements. Um, but I think the the key to it is is to just sort of harness these in, in the ways that that just make sense for specific applications and so on, so that we can make sure that whatever the service is, it just works. And and then that that would be huge. Okay, thank you. Mike, can, can, I comment, can I comment on that? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, I agree. You need more. It's always used for more spectrum. But one of the interesting challenges of six of six G is if we're able to get big bands above a hundred gigahertz, we can have much bigger contiguous bandwidths, which would both allow much faster data rates and conversely very very low latency for the for the small number of applications where extremely low latency is critical. So it's not just more, if we can open up a 20, 30 gigahertz wide band above 100, it's not just more spectrum, it's spectrum which is fundamentally different than the 4G and 5G spec we've ever had because of the data rates and the latency that would be possible. Most users don't need those data rates and, and latency, but, they're, but just as 4G opened up the world to a whole new uses, it could be it could be that when the high data rates and low latency become available, there will be uses which we can't even envision today. So it's not all spectrums the same. Big hunks open up new opportunities. Yeah. Uh, does the, do these wider bandwidths would need a different air interface than OFDM that you have had uh, so far? OFDMA, not OFDM, OFDMA, and uh, you know. Uh, scalable FDMA that 5, uh, 5G had so far. Michael, any views there? Or I, You know, I must admit, hard, I have colleagues who are in the hardware side of things. I'm not, nobody's nobody's raised this as an, un, as an unknown. It, made, it probably won't be the exact same interface, but it, it also is not an impossible new technology either. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. maybe I can Ian? chime in here, yep. Prakash. Uh, yep. I mean, and I'll be in the spirit of healthy debate. I'm actually going to push back uh to both ben and michael mm -hmm. um, i mean you know, at the end of the day the air interface is driven primarily by if you think about it the physics of the propagation right unless we are truly open up truly new spectrum i think that michael is saying um you know the unless we really say we we found a way to do sub terahertz or terahertz um which will likely necessitate a different waveform than OFDM um, because of its you know power efficiency issues, then then there might be a new uh, let's call it waveform at least for those frequencies. But um, I would uh, venture that um, I don't see AI being able to design the next air interface. I, I see AI supporting um, the next air interface. Um, there's there's a lot of talk about um, you know you know replacing uh, the entire modulation, uh, um, you know, coding string with uh, something designed by by a machine that will. Uh, so I, you know, call me a, a um, classical communications wireless guy, but I am 
very skeptical and not just because I want to, uh, I've been going to 3GPP for a long time. And, you know, to be honest, I'd rather not be doing that, but I don't think uh, robots will, will replace, unfortunately, the physical layer engineers that kind of uh, will be working on that. So, so anyway, uh, in the spirit of healthy debate, uh, I would say, you know, if we stay in our current spectrum, even in upper mid band, which I personally am very excited about, it will likely be an OFDM uh, based, you know, um, or maybe some variation of it um, would be at least, um, if I were a betting man, that's what I would bet on right now. Yeah, let me throw a, a curveball in here. So, the, you know, uh, if you look at NTN, which is in a lot of it will be satellite based, then Doppler would be an issue, right? So, um, I mean, IEEE, I think, came up with some suggestions uh, in terms of OTFS, uh, orthogonal time frequency, synchronized, you know, waveform and so on. So, there is some discussion happening. You know, we have had OFDMA since 4G, so we had two generations of it. Maybe, and if you're looking at the new spectrums, uh, new areas that 6G might go in, there might be a, not totally new, but you know, at least in the same frame structure, uh, and have a different waveform which is more uh, you know aligned with these new uses and so on. So, you guys think that would would influence anything in terms of uh, waveform if it's not the full full radio interface? Wants to take that. I, yeah. I do have an opinion. Um, I uh -huh. but I, I would uh, again like I'm not saying that that's the right way to do it. I'm more of a as an industry veteran knowing how things go in 3GPP. Unless mm -hmm. 3GPP truly you know gets replaced by something that is truly revolutionary in the sense of you know if it's an existential threat. Let's say think about the the early WiMAX days where it, it posed an existential threat to um you know to 3g eventually became 4g um i i i i mean these new waveforms are i think it's we should continue to research it i mean there will be lots of folks you know some companies that are truly going to be behind it um but i would venture to say that ofdma is very hard to replace for existing spectrum okay that's a yeah, good I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and yeah. I'll, I'll hop in on that and just agree. yeah. So I, I I agree with Ian what you just said. I, I totally agree. I think I think it's going to be really hard to to replace OFDMA. I think you know there's a lot of interesting stuff that we're learning from non-terrestrial networks about like what you know what type of signals that folks are using and and what's working and what's not working and there's a there's a lot of interesting things there that could potentially help us solve some of the physics problems that ultimately exist in other places and so um uh, i think there's absolutely optimizations and 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 things to learn i don't think it's necessarily going to replace OFD, OFDMA wholesale. Like, I don't think that that's necessarily true. I will say on the, uh, uh, to keep the, the healthy debate going, you know, I, I think on the AI side, what we see, at least from the Keysight point of view, is that there, I don't, you know, it's obviously the replacement of 3GPP by a grand AI, you know, that's not going to happen overnight. That's probably not going to happen at all, realistically. But the, the, the optimization is going to increase in scope in terms of, you know, right now we're taking individual um, uh, uh, processing elements and we're, we're looking at how those can be optimized. And eventually it's going to get to a point where we have to look at that at a system level and we'll keep clustering those things together until maybe we are really looking at a, a you know, entire radio interface that is designed at an AI level. Maybe designed is a heavy handed word. Maybe it really is optimized. Um, uh, but, but we really think that it's going to, we're, we're going to shift into a space where it's very much human intent driven. Um, uh, similarly, in, in the direction in which um, uh, management and orchestration is moving with with what we see in the RIC. It's, it's uh, I think that level of, of um, uh, control from the AI is, is sort of the direction we're, we're going to. Thank yeah, you. I would kind of pile on real quick is, and, and I, I agree with Ben there that, you know, the, the AI and the machine learning, you know, you know trust me, I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent of it, I, I, guess, I guess in terms of really truly automating the network, right? I think Dan mm -hmm. kind of alluded to that, right? The, the, the opportunities of, again, zero touch automation, you know, truly, you know, making the network operations extremely efficient. Um, I think that's, that's where we really want to see. And, and I mean, not to take away from, you know, of course, fundamental air interface uh, research that obviously needs to happen. Uh, but I, I, I just see the energy should really be spent on uh, a lot more about um, automating the network. Yeah.
Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about AI in a little bit. So anybody has uh, opinions on the air interface? Okay, if not, we'll move on to spectrum. So Michael, uh, you mentioned about uh, um, uh, sub terahertz and terahertz. So what's been the RN research so far? Is it in a place that will make it into, by the time we, we have 6G that will be one of the key spectrums that we'll be looking at. Um, and there's discussion on other spectrum as well. So let's start with uh, terahertz and sub terahertz. What's your view? Where is it proven? We still are, you know, trial millimeter wave has been proven so far, but it is taking a lot of time to even scale it. So your views on uh, terahertz and sub terahertz and some of these use cases uh, that you might be thinking. Okay. <clears throat> On, on, let me focus on sub terahertz, which is basically 100 gigahertz and above. Mm -hmm. um, that there certainly have been published experiments which show that you can get point to point use in those bands. Mm -hmm. Have there been experiments for uplinks and downlinks at those frequencies? Realistically, no. But the, but the propagation is well known. There shouldn't be any huge, huge surprises. Where there isn't research is the issue, again, if you don't figure out how to share with the passive users, you're limited to 12 and a half gigahertz contiguous spectrum. And if that's all you need, that's all you need. And but frankly, if you only need 12 and a half gigahertz, why are you, why are you going up to above 100 gigahertz? You can get not that much, but it's not a quantum jump about what you can get below 100 gigahertz. But if you want to get large contiguous bandwidth, then you have to go above 100 gigahertz. And what is needed is experiments to show to the passive community, particularly the passive weather satellite community, that you've developed a sharing mechanism uh, to do that. The problem that is sort of twofold is one, people aren't doing that type of research, but B, at least in the US, the main users of that spectrum are doing everything possible to frustrate this research and prevent experiments. And the spectrum regulators, FCC and NTIA, seem to be indifferent. Uh, it's, it's sort of hard to pick what the word is, but they don't seem to view the issue as, as very important because when federal agencies want to stop something, even if they're federal agencies of the FCC and NTIA, they have ways to stop things that private companies don't have. And unfortunately, um, I have a minor sideline of helping academics get FCC experimental licenses, and it is amazing how frustrating it sometimes be to get an experimental license uh, that tangles in these passive bands. So there, there is a leadership problem in the U.S. about how do we prove this question, which is particularly ironic because the ITU policy that encourages it was one that was literally proposed by the USA at WRC 2000. But somehow there's, there seems to be a lack of institutional memory in the U.S. government remembering that. But the document is readily findable on the IG website. It's not a hidden document. Uh, but there is need for more research uh, to demonstrate uh, not only that you can use it, but you can use it without causing harm to passive systems in the same band. That would be impossible at much lower frequencies. We know the, the problem there is at 24 gigahertz between passive satellites and 5G and 4G, 5G, which is only 150 megahertz away. But when you get above 100 gigahertz, the, the, the factor of absorption in propagation, again, look at my microwave magazine article in the January issue. The issue of absorption lets you use propagation in your favor, uh, not just against you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Dan, any views there? No, not too much to add to that, I don't think. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex, Ben, Ian? Yeah, I, I do have uh, at least some thoughts on, on new spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would, you know, personally, uh, I am very excited about upper mid-band. Uh, okay, yeah, that's the, my next question, but yeah, okay, go uh, ahead. Okay, sorry, I, I, I keep uh, stealing your thunder. Sorry, Prakash. No worries, um, yeah. <laughs> 
but yeah, I, I mean, and, and the reason being is it's, it's, it's a great sweet spot, obviously, for capacity uh, and coverage, um, you know, and, and we've, we've obviously learned quite a bit on millimeter wave, and I think we can take learnings on both C-band and millimeter wave to really truly exploit upper mid-band, um, you know, to get that next leap in terms of, let's say, you know, throughput coverage capacity. Um, and, and going a little bit on the really higher bands, I mean, I, you know, again, I am a bit skeptical of it as, as an air interface. Uh, but I am definitely a supporter of it for backhaul. Um, I think, you know, you were seeing, you know, you know ready E-band radios today making a big difference in terms of capacity. And obviously that the capacity is just going to increase for the backhaul and that's needed. So, um, but anyway, that's kind of my, my two cents on, on the spectrum front. Yeah, uh, Ben, do you have any issue? Uh, and also there are some sensing use cases that you could do with uh, the Hertz as, as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, that perf you teed me up with the only thing. I, I think I agree with everything that's been said already. I think joint comps and sensing is something that that uh, is is something that we can absolutely use these wider bandwidths for. You know, um, being able to get these larger contiguous chunks of spectrum, we're able to have both a rich sounding signal and the bandwidth tra for transmission, and that that actually is, I think, super valuable. I think also looking at some of the automotive radar bands, you know, a lot of I think we we. V to X sometimes feels like both solved and, and completely unsolved all at the same time. Um, but I think one of the spaces where where this becomes interesting is looking at combining vehicle to vehicle communications with the automotive radar, taking what we're learning here and being able to build that into things like cooperative radar. Um, uh, I, I think that there's there's a, a lot of really interesting stuff when we talk about um, uh, the potential for joint comms and sensing. Um, uh, I, I think I think again to looking at like. How do we actually, you know, I'll, my, one of my favorite, uh, I, I dogged on this, the smart agriculture thing earlier, like, I, I think it's really fascinating, joint comms and sensing, there's been some interesting um, uh, research done on on how to, you know, combine those two technologies together of, of actually being able to like, can we get a view into into the farm, basically from the from the uh, 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 JCNS tower, you know, sort of thing that's also providing service to to smart tractors or whatever it might be. Um, uh, so I, I think there's there's a lot of potential for for these uh, uh, higher frequency bands for for that. Okay, perfect. Anybody else wants to chime in? Okay. All right, so let's start with Alex. So uh, Alex, I think you know you've seen a lot of uh, 6G material panels and such being part of 6G word. What are some of the use cases that people are talking about that one you need 6G and what are some of the things that they they need to make those happen? Um, there there are quite a few, and it depends who you talk to. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, as as, as mentioned. Um, you know, if you if you talk to to some people, they they'll have a, a radically different interpretation of what six G is or should be used for, um, and and that that kind of ties into those use cases. Um, I mean, from from the government point of view, things like uh, overcoming digital divides. I mean that that can be partly a, a technology issue, but but it's at least as much a question of sort of business and, and mindset. Um, and I think if um, if we look at that that question around business models, mindsets, and so on, then then you can get all, all kinds of use cases that, that we don't have uh, today. You know whether that's, uh, for example, being able to to sort of continuously track um, uh, food, let's say from, from its field in in wherever it happens to be um, to your plate. Um, that may be, you know, a, a minor benefit uh, if you're very interested in in um you know having organic produce for example but if you if you sort of switch that around to to things like medicines and being able to, to sort of track uh, the conditions in which they're being transported that can have a huge impact on um their viability for example um and uh, and, and the the rates of success uh, on inoculations that kind of thing um if you're able to to track that in real time as things are going then you can identify problems um, potentially be aware of um, issues that might arise and, and avoid them, that kind of thing, which starts to feed into the whole question around AI and, and how that cooperates between uh, different elements of sensors and, and so on. Um, so I think once, once we have these, these issues around, you know, ubiquity and the ability to tie that into AI, data analysis and that kind of thing, then, then the use cases are just going to explode 
Okay. Thank you. Dan, I think you mentioned about uh, business to business being one of the key things. Uh, I know any views on the uh, why you need 6G and what are some of the use cases and applications? Yeah, so so it, perhaps it's not directly that, but I, I think it's a, a bit of a reaction to Alex's point and, and maybe coming back to that point as well. Um, for, for any service, any service of any G to be viable, then then it has to deliver an incremental value, which which is more than the, the amount it costs to deliver, to, to deliver the connectivity or deliver the service. Otherwise, the business case doesn't stack up. Um, and, you know, as much as we've talked about things like uh, sustainability and, and, uh, and energy efficiency and so on, um, the hard economics of it is that that people don't build networks as altruistic endeavors in, in, the, in the larger part. People build networks because they, they see a business case and they want to deliver a service which will ultimately generate some revenue. So whatever the, the future B2B use cases are, they, they have to be revenue generating for all parties in the process. And, and I think that's been the biggest challenge in terms of trying to get a B2B ecosystem off the ground in 5G as well, is that first of all, when it's B2B, you have more parts of the ecosystem that all need to take a, a portion out of it. Um, and secondly, when, when you start to look at what B2B actually implies, it's not um, in any way the same as B2C, where to a certain extent, you're delivering one service to everybody. You're, you're, you're delivering uh, um, voice data and, connect, and, and text messaging, maybe, maybe not so much now, but, but you're delivering it to an ecosystem of handsets, which all follow the same specs, even if they don't use the same chipsets, but they're all working in roughly the same spectrum bands with roughly the same chipset requirements, um, which generates massive economy of scale. So, so the, the watershed moment is when B2B use cases generate the right levels of economy of scale to make them economically viable to start to be deployed. Um, and that's the one of the problems which we are going to face when it comes to also doing things like um, meeting sustainability goals and delivering um, services that, that go across the digital divide. People would love to be able to generate revenue out of the, that, that lower you know, the tier in society, which we're talking about when we're talking about people who are on the other side of the digital divide, because that's a hard, huge untapped market, which is understood as still being a B2C opportunity. Um, all of that comes down to the economics of the network, ultimately. Um, and the economics of the network need to shift to, in order to enable that. So that's that's the goal you have to go after, right? You have to go after the, the economics of the network in order to be able to, to shift the dial. And you have to identify applications which have sufficient scale and sufficient revenue to make them viable in a B2B space. Um, the challenge has always been that, um, that, that those two things don't add up for network operators. Um, I, way back in the questions, I was reading the questions online, and one of them was, was with regard to coverage. Um, around about this time in the 5G debate, I, uh, I did a panel at Mobile World Congress where, where one of the questions was, can 5G deliver the promises? Uh, and one of the promises was around coverage. And I, uh, my first slide was in huge letters, it just said yes. Um, but then the next slide was, uh, yes, if you have a very large checkbook. And, uh, and at the time I said, if anybody would like me to spec them a 100% coverage network, I can do that now, um, but you have to pay for it and you have to put cells in lots of places where people don't go and the cells don't generate revenue, but they sit there and burn power for the very rare occasions when people turn up. And, and that's where we are. You know, if there's a B2B use case out there which will generate revenue in places where a network exists in a way which scales in the right way for both the other side of the B2B use case and the, and the network operator, then it will happen. If it doesn't, then it won't. And, and that's the start reality of it. All right, thank you. Ben, Ian, Michael, do I um, Nothing to add for me. Yeah, nothing yeah. to add for me. Okay, all right. I mean, usually when I started discussing 5G, everybody was jump, would jump on use cases and applications for 5G. And in 6G, that is the question nobody wants to take and touch, right? So it's a stark difference that I've seen. I've been doing this for some time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can jump on and, and just sort of, there, there's some stuff Dan's mentioned there, which I'd, I'd be sort of quite keen to answer to. Um, yeah. And uh, and that's that's around these these questions of the business models and so on. I mean, you're, 
you know, Dan's quite right. The, the financial business case has to be there for the, for the operators. Um, and, and there is some uh, hunting around for what that, that would be, whether that's to do with cost savings. Um, but I think also the, the question of how we can, can create you know, value-added elements. There, there are um, conversations, uh, as, as we've seen for a long time, around the, the idea of platforms that are enabled by telco resources um and uh you know th this is this is something which is being revisited um there are going to be capabilities in the networks um and and intelligence there which can be used and the the challenge is going to be actually managing to um to turn those into workable services so for example as, as we improve uh questions around security authentication um and, and so on there is potentially a, a huge market there which could tie to uh, not just um, security, but also uh, things adjacent to it in, in for example, insurance or, or so on, um, fraud management for, for all kinds of uh, organisations. It just needs to be thought out and, and we need to, to sort of shift from, from you know, a focus purely on the technologies to what those actual services and, and offerings can look like. Yeah, I, I mean, just just to maybe round that out and and add the the final element into this, the other aspect in terms of going after applications specifically which are B two B is that you're dealing with a very different customer sitting on the other side of the table to you, right? So, so when it is a consumer on a smartphone or on a phone, um, if if the network is down, if something doesn't go right, in most cases there's not much recourse. You know, if, if, if I can't surf the internet, if I can't view YouTube, um, I don't ring up and demand a, a, a penalty payment because my contract has that clause in it. When it's B2B and it's large numbers of, of connections, people do that. You know, it's a much more serious business contract that you're making with an automotive manufacturer for connecting cars or for, with, a, with a factory for connecting up their, their production line than it is with me sitting at home with, with with this device on my desk um and as a result of that there's much more risk associated with it um so i i, I oh gosh i did a presentation maybe eight years ago about this kind of cycle of, of how things are, happen in operators and how you know your your technologists and your marketing team your sales team get carried away with the hype around a, a new technology and then the start reality hits when somebody is sitting down with a contract in front of them, the legal team have to say, well, can we actually deliver this six nines reliable, 100% coverage guaranteed 100 megabit per second um, network for, for 2 million connections for this one customer? Um, and when all those people who were generating all the hype say, well, no, then the contract doesn't get signed. Um, and that's the same as it's always been. And it's the same as it will be in 6G. And, and when we go to a new technology, and particularly if that technology has the perception that it is a revolution, it has to earn its stripes. It has to get that level of trust in it in an operational environment before people are prepared to, to sign that kind of contract. And the net result of that is that the first use case always ends up being B2C because it's de-risked. You understand the customer, you understand the risk appetite, and as a result, that's what you do first. Yeah, that's fascinating uh, discussion. I mean, if you look at 5G, we are at that phase now, right? We have done the easy part, which is B2C. Now in 5G, we, when you look at 5G Advanced, there are lots of stuff that kind of, you know, allows the operators and the, uh, you know, others in the value chain to give that kind of reliability and, you know, service assurance, but that's yet to be implemented. And, you know, and there will be interest in the ecosystem to implement if there is, enough uh, market this year. I mean, I, they, they see enough market, but I think there is initial inertia that you have to implement it first and then, you know, then the the uh, the monetization will be a slow process. I think that's, is this that cycle that we are in, you know, for 5G in my view. So hopefully by the time we go to 2030, when uh, 5G is expected to be coming, some of those friction points are resolved and you know, much more streamlined process in place for especially B2B, I think, right? So that's the yeah, hope so, at least. So that was kind of my point with, with regard to the answer to the evolution or revolution question. I think yeah. a revolution is coming. Yeah. Um, I just think that it's not necessarily 
a technical revolution. It's a risk appetite and business case revolution. Exactly. And when it happens, you know, the, the dam break and that, that's where the hockey stick on, on exactly. the B2B connection numbers comes. Perfect. So let's uh, change gears. Let's move to uh, the network side. I think, uh, you know, and 5G was mostly sold on uh, use cases uh, and, and so on, right? All the, we all remember this remote surgery on wireless connection kind of use case, which I know I'm still looking for uh, my, my next surgery to be that. I don't know how long I'll wait. So what I think in 60, it is more because of the discussions themselves or because of the scope and how the things are turning out. It is more of a network-based discussion and network-focused uh, 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 evolution or revolution, whatever you want to call it, in my view, at least. So, you know, we have we have had a hype cycle of uh, open RAN and VRAN, uh, but on the on the realistic side, VRAN is kind of uh, becoming a mainstream. Multi-vendor open RAN could be a next step. We'll see how that goes. This disaggregation with VRAN has already happened. Uh, I know the softwareization that uh, you know, as most of you talked about, is happening as well. So, how will that uh, shape uh, 6G? So, for example, will 6G be uh, disaggregated uh, by design when you start off in 5G? It was kind of a you know afterthought, right? You basically implemented with legacy and then looked at uh, these things. So, based on how things are going, you guys thinks uh, you guys think. 60 will be natively disaggregated, uh, mostly software driven. Let's start with uh, Ian. Yeah, I, I could definitely chime in there, given that I'm actually in the ORN Alliance face to face meeting mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in Prague. So, okay. So, I think there's a maybe a misconception that 5G is not disaggregated. Like, if you think about just even 3GPP specs and not, not even thinking about ORAN, I mean, think about the DUCU split, like an F1 interface, and think about the core. I mean, it's we're already on the journey towards disaggregation, right? If you think about even RU and DU, it is disaggregated. It's just not a standardized interface in, in, in 4G and maybe let's call it um, non-ORAN 5G, right? So, so we're, 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 we're trending towards even further disaggregation. Um, I think maybe the, the, the key question there is, will it truly be multi-vendor disaggregation? Um, I think the, 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 the spirit and the vision is to truly make that a multi-vendor disaggregation so that there is truly, let's call it the benefit of you know, supplier diversity that operators can lean on. And of course, you know, innovation that specialists can, can work on, let's say with the you know, X apps and R apps on, on the RIC, right? I think uh, I, I tend to agree with you, Prakash. I mean, I think the, I, and I, I, the conversation is definitely about the network. Um, things that I can see in terms of the, the next leap is, you know, apart from softwareization, of course, we're seeing cloudification, you know, containerization of, of all the network functions. And, and I think that the next big leap here is, um, you know, almost like a RAN and core aggregation in a way it's kind of like a bit of a reverse there right we're in you're seeing that the ran getting disaggregated but you're also going to see like you know the utilization of of cloud technologies to truly seep down all the way down to the ran i mean today you need uh, an edge device for the du um you know most likely for 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 high performance applications and and today there's kind of these you know a lot of interfaces you could think about it right between the the DU and CU and core. So, so I see that as kind of a flattening uh, a bit of the network wherein uh, RAN and core can truly converge, you know, truly leverage, you know, um, service space management um, type of architectures uh, for, for the next generation. So. Thanks. Ben. Yeah, I, I I'll, uh, I'll pile onto that. I, I, I totally agree. I think that the, the disaggregation and virtualization value there for the network, like it, it's, it's too invaluable to ignore. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, whether it's, it's the, the integration of, of how we can actually improve management, um, uh, being able to spin up resources dynamically, being able to, you know, have a, a long-term scale, a long-term roadmap to scalability, um, and optimization like that is massive for the network. And I, I think from the from the open side of things, the multi vendor open side, you know, I think uh, Ian and I, I bet I will, I bet he'll agree. We're both for the test vendor perspective. This is great. This is awesome. We'd love open. There's a lot of interoperability testing that has to happen. There's a lot of uh, test points that are out there. 
is it what's best for the consumer or is it what's best for a specific deployment? I think that's that's the question to be answered is 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 a multi-vendor solution going to be the the best move? What what I would like to one of the, the I think the advantages of open uh, 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 and uh, an open RAN um, or or a, a multi-vendor RAN and what that what that ecosystem allows for that I think isn't talked about all the time is whether it opens up for academia and, and the academic collaboration to industry. You know, if, if you look back to the days of like, I remember working with universities when they were on 4G stacks and their 4G stacks were just some DIY thing they put together themselves or it was some open source, open air interface stack that didn't scale to any industry collaboration. It wasn't something that they could actually take to industry and say, hey, we, you know, they could show it in their sandbox, but actually getting it off of their sandbox and into the hands of industry didn't happen. And so we talk, you know, we know there's that valley of death between between uh, the, the, the you know, design prototyping research stage to actual industry uh, adoption, making it such that these tools are open and that these systems, you know, they have plug and play interfaces and, and that 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 you actually can have a, a research university that can hand something directly off into that ecosystem, I think is is very, very valuable um, uh, and, and, and worth having in the ecosystem. But again, I think it comes back to what's best for a particular deployment, a particular uh, uh, customer need um, uh, is is that multi vendor ecosystem going to be what's what's most needed there? Thank you, uh, Michael. Any views there or okay, Dan. I, I have about hundred views. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I think that if you were to kind of put uh, Ian and Ben's views into a nutshell, what we're talking about is a is a hugely dynamic network now where you know the the separation between hardware and software has has been almost completely put through you know you, you you've got to the point where you could put the entire network in an edge you could put it in a central database you could put it in a cloud um if you were to do that those three networks would behave fundamentally differently and deliver fundamentally different KPIs but that's about the under underlying network topology um and that's not a bad thing because what we actually need is that flexibility in, in the supported KPIs because you can't deliver all KPIs from one static network implementation. You have to have the capability to optimize the placement of, of functionality within the network to meet the KPIs that the specific services require. Um, and you know, not wishing to go back to the, the previous discourse, but you, you're going to have a requirement to meet a whole range of KPIs in order to open up this floodgate of new levels of connectivity and, and, and numbers of subscriptions. So, so that flexibility has to be put in place. And we've kind of gone 90% of the route down that level of flexibility in, in, the, in the path that we've taken with disaggregation of the RAN and, and SBA and SBMA for the core and the management. Um, and so the last part is the challenge of the, of the last 10%. The problem is that the last 10% fundamentally breaks a lot of things that um, those of us who have been in 3GPP for, for any length of time know that the people who have been there even longer don't like breaking. Um, so I, I, found, I found the whole definition of SBA to be fascinating in a very weird standards-based kind of way in that you took all of the existing network functions, which, which were basically defined in GPRS uh, in 2G, um, as things that were placed in networks at specific topological points to enable the, the network to operate um, and scale. Um, and they've been maintained onwards without really anybody challenging that assumption up until the point where SBA came along and everything's on an HTTPS interface and all of the individual microservices are, are explicitly identified in the spec. And then they put them all back together again in the same way within, within what's expected to be network functions and containers. Um, and that doesn't make any sense. And then you take that and you kind of look at the, you look at the CU part of, uh, of a disaggregated RAN and you go, well, is that CU really a RAN function anymore? Because it, it looks a heck of a lot like some of the things that are going on in the core. And you look at the, the user plane functions, which are still two separate functions located in two separate places, but the interface in between them is relatively proprietary and you start to wonder whether that's really the most sensible way to implement the user plane anymore. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some really big play, things to go after there. Um, and the interesting part is that when you start to get new and exciting um, 
uh, requirements coming through because they aren't just more bandwidth and lower latency you actually have some things to some operational aspects to hang that challenge and and, and that revolution on um so yes yeah, so that's where we're going after it thank you alex any views um well i mean honestly uh you know my my fellow panelists here are, are much more um technically astute than I am but uh, but but I will say I, th I think there is there is something fascinating behind all this in insofar as um, you know th there is definitely pressure from the ITU to see uh, disaggregated open cloud native networks in, in the next generation there, there was a, a publication in November um, that stated as much um, the the implications behind that, I think, are, are fascinating because, it, as as uh, we've mentioned, once you go to something which is fundamentally software running over a, a hardware network, then um, you can start to to sort of run, uh, let's say, slices across multiple, um, you know, physical networks owned by different players and so on, and uh, and arguably the competition then starts to become about you know who's got the best orchestration or, or the best uh, uh, management to, to run these services across the, the different players and um, uh, yeah it, it sort of changes the games in, in terms of you know moving from who's got the best network or the best coverage or so on because that's kind of irrelevant um, you know you're just making sure it works on whatever the access network is that's, that's available and then um, uh, you know the the, the commercials and, and that uh, that that race for, for the best orchestration at the lowest cost becomes uh, becomes the the competitive environment. All right, thank you. So uh, let's move to another interesting subject. I think uh, Ben, you mentioned. So let's start with you, uh, AI. So right now, I mean, five G Advance has AI released seventeen at least, but a lot of it is more on channel estimation and so on. Um, but if you look at the vision of AI that it will be cross learning so we'll have ai and uh, in the devices ai in the network so and uh, there is some framework being uh, proposed now i see some of the you know uh, demos and mobile congress on this as well that there is cross learning without sharing too much information they can you know converge on a common uh, you know frame structure really interface if you will which basically will be you know depending on what the applications you're using, what the channel condition in, and so on, right? So uh, my question is, if there is so much of AI happening on network and the device side, will there be new uh, evolutions, like, you know, uh, generations are really needed if, if the whole AI, if the whole AI interface becomes very dynamic with AI, do we have to keep on developing these new generations of technologies for air interface? So, yeah, larger question is role of AI, specifically on you know how can how far 60 can go with ai hmm. sure. so, uh, oh you go ahead uh, oh sorry i thought i thought you were asking uh, my bad. Uh, maybe i got my bends and my dance you go ben <laughs> uh, i all, all i'll say quickly here is is that um uh you know i i to, to maybe answer the small question of do, do we get rid of the G's once everything becomes AI optimized or, or, or AI, like when the AI takes over, right? Now, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think if you look at this, you know, um, uh, the AI is not going to, to necessarily move outside of its, its given bandwidth. It's not going to, to, uh, you know, throw in spectral hopping where it, where it doesn't know the need to, it doesn't, if you don't tell it to coexist with Wi-Fi, it won't coexist with Wi-Fi. It's not going to create knowledge. It's going to synthesize problems here. And I, I think we can, we can see it advance but at the end of the day the new ideas are still going to come from from the researchers uh uh from from industry developing things you know i, I the the hardware is still going to iterate even if our software becomes self-sufficient and self-optimizing um uh we'll still need to build next generation hardware systems we'll, we'll still have have that component there um uh but I, so so you know ultimately i think um uh i think ai is going to be a de facto tool for for the the network um uh both in terms of uh uh you know we think it's going to span across the ran and 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 beyond but you know i think it's it's going to be something that is that's got to still be driven by human creativity and ingenuity at the end of the day thanks ian i, I know that you have strong uh, views on it 
and then yeah they're... no i i think i've, I've kind of uh, talked about them a little bit uh a while ago but, but i i do feel that um i mean definitely ai has a role i mean at the end of the day it is a tool um i mean let's talk about machine learning as a tool and and we we need to deploy it in 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 really the, the right areas right uh, as far as like yeah i mean if if you think about it yeah if just and sometimes I don't know if, you know people don't realize, but you know, given kind of going back to my three GPP roots, okay. So so by the end of this year, uh, release eighteen is pretty much going to be wrapped up, and release nineteen is going to start early next year, and they're going to start talking about um, requirements, um, you know, in the SA, um, and then before long, um, you're you're actually going to see a study item. Um, that's going to be oh, the workshop, right? Um, that's going to be talked about. So, so it it sounds like very far away, but it truly is not. So, so I think it's it's really important for us to, to start honing in on the key areas that are truly going to be important for um, again, like thinking about the network. Um, I mean, of course, you know, we, you know, thinking about this the new spectrum that's going to going to help us and. And yeah, I mean, will will there be a seven G? Um, ma'am, you know, I I I do think so. Um, but uh, you know, eight G, nine G, I don't know. It's too far away, and by then I'll be retired, so maybe I don't care. Thanks, <laughs> Michael. Did you have anything to say or? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not big on using AI. Okay, right. <laughs> I'm sure it has Dan. uses, but I, I, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> and Dan, yeah. So so. We, we've ended up answering about four different questions there. So, um, so AI, AI itself, um, you know, we, we, we've demonstrated some uses of AI. We've, we've done some quite cool stuff, which is starting to filter out into network deployments as well. Um, we certainly see value in, uh, in federated learning and spec computing. So the division of, uh, of where algorithms actually get run between devices and networks and transfer of data between the two. Um, one of the things which I think we will, you know, we, we are coming towards the peak of a hype cycle around AI and, and we will end up in a trough at some point. I think one of the big troughs is, you know, particularly if you're using AI as a mechanism to, to do energy efficiency, the energy that the AI itself uses is kind of challenging in a lot of cases. You've got to train models. Yeah. Um, so there, there needs to be a techno-economic understanding of, of what the benefit of a specific application of AI is um, versus the the cost of the AI, the implementation of the AI itself, um, and then the the other challenge which we will address at some point is um, often you know you, if you if you apply AI to a specific optimization alone, um, and then next to it is another AI implementation which is optimizing to a different goal, they they can actually destroy each other. They can they can pull pieces of the network in opposite directions. So somewhere down the line, we need to start looking at things around AI frameworks um, and, and where we are at the moment in terms of standardization, which no, none of the standardization actually does much to explicitly call out AI, but it's all kind of hinted at. So um, Ian in, in 3GPP has got NWDAF and MDAS sitting there within the management and the, and the core network domain as points where data is taken out of the network and is analyzed and, and results in something coming back. And that's kind of AI is hiding behind there somewhere. In ORAN, you have near real time and non real time RIC um, performing similar kind of roles. Um, but it's all per domain. Um, and it doesn't really say that if you want to do an end to end optimization, you need end to end availability of data and end to end application of AI. Um, and then you get into this kind of slightly existential debate about, well, we're also running up against um, the expertise of 30 years of human intelligence, which has done a pretty good job of designing networks up to now. So where are the places where you can actually squeeze out um, optimizations? And there's some which are really low hanging fruit that we, we've gone after. There's some which are kind of a, a lot more um, challenging to the way that networks are built and designed. So that then takes you down that question of, is there going to be a 7G? Um, and uh, in my in my less vendor dependent days, uh, I challenged the fact that five G was just a marketing term. Um, I think that if we get if we get softwareization of the network right, if we get network slicing right, um, we get lifecycle management right, then then G's go away because you just segment off part of the network and you do something new and experimental. Um, and apart from the places where there is the, these nasty issues like like interference on the RAN, 
then then lots and lots of different networks doing lots and lots of different things with different topologies, different optimizations. They can all coexist because they're all sitting there running as separate containers on one big server farm. Um, and, and I think that's ultimately where we go to in, in the next kind of five to 10 years. And then G's go away because everything just coexists. All right, thanks. So uh, we're you know hitting our time limit here. So let me ask the last question. I'll start with Michael. Uh, you know, if you are to meet in uh, say next five years, it would still be before the you know uh, intended uh, or target timeline for six G, which is twenty thirty, right? So it'll be twenty twenty seven or twenty eight if we meet in next five years. Where do you think the discussion of six G will be? So let's start with Michael. Maybe you want to focus on spectrum. You know, where you think how far we'll go. Uh, uh, in, in in terms of uh, realizing the vision of uh, terahertz? Well, <clears throat> I, I'm i seriously worried about the availability of spectrum above 100 gigahertz unless FCC and NTIA mm -hmm. get their act together. Uh, you may recall about a year ago, one agency whose name won't be mentioned had a temper tantrum that threatened to turn, to, turn off all aviation in the United States. Yeah. Um, 100 gigahertz involves a different agency, but it too seems to have temper tantrums. And at some point, the spectrum management, the Congress and the executive branch has to decide who's in charge of, of spectrum management in the United States. Because the de facto situation at the moment is that the large federal agencies think they're in the UN Security Council and they each have veto power over anything they don't like. And, you know, the US has two agencies, FCC and NTIA, responsible for spectrum management. It doesn't really need a dozen more uh, to be involved, each with veto power, and that's that's a fundamental problem. So I'm a little bit concerned because FCC and NTIA haven't been able to focus on the issue and make any progress. So there may not be any spectrum above 100 gigahertz or any that's particularly useful uh, unless FCC and NTIA get their act together. Yeah, thank you. So, Alex, where you think we'll be in uh, next five years, and what we'll be discussing if you meet on a conference like this? Thirty seconds or less, including the time. Yeah, I think there are two um, two possible scenarios. Uh, we've talked on this webinar a number of times in different contexts about the need to change mindsets and approaches, and I think that that is going to be critical. There, there is also a huge amount of momentum in the industry from from previous years you know where people kind of know the process and and if you know i think there's a terrible risk that if that kind of thing carries on and we we just do what we did last time but at slightly higher frequencies or whatever it may be then we kind of miss the point and and we end up sort of stuck in the same cycle so i hope five years from now we're, we're actually sort of sitting down in a, a, a fair way through um, at least uh, starting to find solutions to, to some of the problems and, and talking with industries and potential end users about how we do it and why we're doing it um, before we actually launch and making sure that there's 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 use cases and, and uh, desire there for it. Um, but thank yeah. You. yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, Ben, 30 seconds or less. Sure, I'll be quick with my hot takes. Um, okay. I think we will be reflecting on our design decisions and our choices from a killer app that none of us saw coming. I think if we look at telepresence and what happened in the last five years, I think that's a pretty good example. Um, I think we'll be using a lot more AI. I'm a believer in AI. I think it'll be doing everything from writing our prep notes to uh, uh, at governance. We're we'll talking about governance of AI and AI security. I think when it comes to security, I think quantum is gonna break everything and quantum computing is gonna be a whole new animal that we have to discuss. Okay. And uh, I still think we're going to be solving high frequency challenges. I still think millimeter wave and terahertz will have some physics things we'll be we'll be working on. And I think people are going to need a lot of key site measurement equipment to get that done. All right. Thank you. Hope so. <laughs> Ian, <laughs> 30 seconds or less, maybe 15 now. <laughs> it's all, I, I would be, uh, okay, I, I think in five years, we'll finally figure out how to do millimeter wave right uh, for 5G advance. Um, I think uh, the... ORAN Alliance, or at least the companies that are fully behind it, will be able to merge some aspects of a, an open front hall into 3GPP. And I think we will all be very excited about upper mid band. Thank you. Dan, you get the last word. Yeah, I think, uh, so my heart wants to give Alex's answer. 
uh, my head says that we'll be awaiting for the, the first overhyped marketed uh, 6G network launch with a 6G handset of some description. Um, and then we'll be wondering how we're going to make it all work on an economic basis. Thank you, guys. It was a great discussion. Uh, you know, we could take all, we could talk all uh, day about this and still not done with all the questions that we have. Uh, I know a lot of questions came in, good questions came in from the audience. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for listening to all of us. And uh, thank you to all of our panelists uh, for making this a very interesting discussion. Uh, I want to highlight that uh, WCA is a uh, is a nonprofit organization. It is a voluntary driven organization. So, and here are some of our sponsors which make uh, you know such interesting discussions uh, possible. So, I highly encourage all of you, the panelists and the viewers, to look at so sponsoring some of the things uh, that we do at WCA, uh, so that we keep the lights on and you know. Uh, do more of such discussions um and when you when you logged in all the uh, all the participant and attendees you are were automatically entered into a raffle uh, which will be uh, with an interesting uh, prize uh i know i would request uh, peter walter to give us uh, details on the raffle and uh, who who won it uh, peter take it away yeah, thank you so much, Prakash, for uh, the wonderful event, also to our panel and panelists. Um, uh, the answer five years from now, I hope I will retire. The chocolate business for my wife is doing good. <laughs> so at the moment, I, I have a new job as chocolate testing officer. So she has a chocolate shop. Uh, yeah, like I said, in five years, hopefully I can retire and will not sit here anymore at the WCA. But the WCA will go on, we will participate and we will celebrate 30 years WCA this year. And we will be also there the next 30 years. Yeah, probably not with me, but with anybody else. So with this, having this it. So behind me, you see the picture from our raffle. It's it's a comic strip with Superman and some yellow guy. Uh, ben probably knows it from the last time and also Michael. This is the microwave man. So Superman is fighting against a microwave man. So to all our 6G and also later one millimeter wave and um, uh, Terriers event, uh, which is coming, uh, by the way, in July, uh, we will raffle off, we give away this uh, kind of uh, comic strip. And the winner of this uh, giveaway is Jeff Hodge. Jeff Hodge, please send me your email. Uh, and with your address also. Did you leave right now? Oh no, he's still here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wherever you sit, like uh, like I said, Jeff, please send me uh, your address so we can ship uh, the kind of comic, uh, comic trip to you to Peter at wca.org. Uh, with this, I hand back to Prakash for final words and thanks again for the show. Oh, final words for me. Uh, these um, recordings will be made available on our uh, social medias um, within 48 hours. And I tried that Prakash will answer all the remaining question and answer from the panel in a kind of, I don't know, uh, self-made video or so on, which we attach at the end of the video. Okay, with this, Prakash, final words to you. Thank you so much for everybody. All right, so yeah, thank you, Walter. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, so I also wanted to highlight uh, the our upcoming event, uh, which will be on March 9th. Uh, it's a recap on uh, Mobile World Congress 2023. I uh, you know on what happened, what are the some of the hot takes from there. Uh, please uh, request you to register on our website, uh, www.wca.org uh, uh, for that event. And um, you can re reach WCA out of these channels on our webpage. Uh, at our uh, Twitter uh, handle, WCAORG, um, and a YouTube channel where, as Peter mentioned, uh, the video of this will be mentioned. And you can find the video recordings of the previous events as well. And we have a LinkedIn presence. You know, uh, please make sure to connect with us uh, to get the latest from WCA. Uh, with that, I would like to again thank uh, all the panelists for this very engaging and interesting uh, discussion on 6G. Uh, we hope. Uh, no, uh, we'll have more of these uh, discussions on WCA with you guys. Thanks for coming in. And thanks to all the attendees again for uh, staying on 
and listen to all of our uh, comments and asking very nice questions. Uh, we'll try to get, I hope we address some of them during the discussions, anything that we did not uh, address during the discussion, we'll try to get back to you on those. And uh, thanks again to WCA for hosting this uh, uh, this webinar. Um, hope to see all of you in the next one. Thank you.